Good evening and welcome everyone to the March 13th, 2023 meeting of the Town of Arlington Redevelopment Board. I'd like to call this meeting to order. My name is Rachel Zenberry. I'm the chair of the board and I'd love for the other members of the board to please introduce themselves, starting with Steve. Uh, Steve Revelock, good evening. Eugene Benson, good evening. Ken Lau. And we have uh, Kelly Linema joining us uh, this evening as well, who is the assistant director of the Department of Planning and Community. Uh, so just a uh, quick note that we are being recorded by uh, ACMI. Um, and without further ado, let's jump right into our agenda this evening, which is the discussion, uh, the continuation, excuse me, of the public hearings for the 2023 annual town meeting warrant articles. Uh, there are three articles this evening, which we will um, be uh, reviewing and hearing, um, hearing a presentation from the uh, individuals who uh, created these uh, proposed zoning amendments. Um, we will uh, ask each individual when they are called to come up and um, present uh, the, the text. Um, we'll first start with asking uh, Kelly to provide some background from the memo that was provided and included in the materials this evening by the Department of Planning and Community Development. Then we'll give each individual an opportunity to present the uh, proposed amendment. We'll take um, any questions from the board, and then we will take any questions from the members of the public who are joining us this evening. Just as a reminder, um, we will not be discussing and uh, voting on this article this evening. That will um, be on the 27th of March. Um, we will deliberate and vote on the 27th. Um, and uh, we will, uh, at that time, uh, identify whether the Redevelopment Board will vote um, to recommend action or no action to uh, town meeting. All right, so without further ado, let's um, move right into the discussion around Article 32, the Zoning Bylaw Amendment related to building affordable housing anywhere. So I'd like to invite um, Thomas Perkins to please join us right here. Thank you so much. And Thank um, you. first, I'd love to see if um, Kelly has anything that she would like to um, uh, highlight for the board from the memo that was prepared. Sure. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Kelly Linema, Assistant Director, Department of Planning and Community Development. Um, I think just a few things I'd like to note about this proposal. Um, the first is that the idea of encouraging and promoting affordable housing throughout the town is broadly encouraged by a number of town planning documents. It, from the master plan through the housing production plan, both the 2016 housing Pro production plan and the more recent update in 2022, um, the fair housing action plan, and then also the recently completed affordable housing action plan of the affordable housing trust. Um, however, in those planning documents, um, not including the master plan, what is recommended is an affordable housing overlay. And I think the the level of complication, and I, I recognize that Mr. Perkins did an enormous amount of work in preparing this because sifting through the bylaw is very challenging, especially when you're looking at things like parking and open space and all of that. Um, and then looking at se the separate section on affordable housing. I would say that the level of complication of doing that really highlights why an affordable housing overlay is the key recommendation. Um, I also note that this is a high priority for for my department um, in, in studying an affordable housing overlay. And so we definitely want to do that. It may take a certain amount of um, like consultant expertise, uh, definitely doing a certain amount of uh, community outreach and engagement to affordable housing developers, the broader community, to really try to understand some of the technical details and where the most appropriate location or if it or the affordable housing overlay, if it should be more like Cambridge's overlay, which is um, throughout the entire municipality. So I would say overall, the, I, the spirit of the amendment is is laudable. Um, we noted that there's probably a bit of work that still needs to be done um, before this would be in a form that could be submitted to town meeting. Great. Thank you, Kelly. I appreciate it. Um, with that, I'd love to turn it over to, to you for a, a presentation or anything that you'd like to say um, related to the uh, article that you've proposed. Uh, I don't really have a presentation. 
presentation. I mean, I can do a quick summary, but I assume that would everyone be... here has already read it. So yep. So I mean, if there's, if you would just I mean, like us to I jump can, right in, we can do I that. All I really note is that I haven't heard back from town council yet. I mm -hmm. emailed him ten days ago, asking uh, for what kind of shape it is, and I haven't heard back. Uh, I also recently noticed when I was looking at it tonight that one of the revisions I thought I'd done isn't present. I thought I'd shifted some things in certain zones to be uh, some of the setbacks to be five plus height divided by three rather than 10 plus height divided by six in order to better support uh, one story structures with that was done as additional primary buildings. But I thought I'd done that, but I couldn't find it anywhere in the document. Uh, functionally, I, I, I'm sorry, before you jump in, I, I neglected to ask if you wouldn't mind, please, um, in, uh, introducing yourself by first last name and address just for the record. Uh, Thomas Perkins, uh, 21 Cliff Street. Thank you so much. Please go ahead. Uh, say, uh, I'd say, uh, the proposal I have isn't much diff certainly isn't much different from a uh, housing overlay because uh, the only district I really didn't cover in my revisions was industrial because, I mean, it doesn't make any sense to have anything in the open space district and planned unit development and the other one, I forget, is, are basically already housing specialty districts with their own housing specialty rules. So it pretty much does cover just about every place. Thank you so much. And um, like Kelly, I just want to say that I appreciate the amount of work that went into um, your preparation of the proposal. So uh, thank you. Um, so what I'd like to do is turn it over to members of the board for uh, any questions that you might have um, or comments uh, for the uh, proponent of this article, starting with Ken. I'm going to stay kind of kind of general for now to see what the rest of the board members say and I'd like to circle back maybe in some of the details but uh, I too uh, agree you've done a lot of work here and I think we are we are in aligned with wanting to do more uh, affordable housing I'm just a little confused here what you have here um, did you what when you were doing this did you talk to any uh, realtors or developers or anything uh, that would like uh, encourage people to do more of this and see how this would be a way of encouraging them to do more? No, I don't know any developers uh, to really get the finer details. Uh... Okay, fair enough. Uh, I'm just trying to think of if I was a developer, okay, um, having as of right to do a, a fully affordable housing, um, what difference is that uh, advantage I get from not doing 40B, which is, I believe, 20%, right? Uh, affordable housing. And I would get the same rights as this right here. What's the difference? Uh, at a higher level, I'm not trying to get all the little minutia here, okay? And how do you see that? Well, to my understanding, the basic thing about 40B is that uh, it can be turned down and then there's an appeals process. You appeal to the state and maybe the state will grant your appeal, maybe it won't. And that creates quite a bit of uncertainty and bureaucratic uncertainty, especially the further it goes out, can add a cost of 5 or 10 percent to the estimated cost of a project. I mean, if you have to wait a year before you get a final conclusion, then that's a year of not building or developing or getting revenue on a property. So mostly it's just meant to make the process faster and easier to get done. Okay. Uh, with that said, uh, with 40B, it's not a fully affordable housing. So what I'll, I'm just going to stay with the private developers for now, okay? They need a certain amount of market rate units to support the affordable units. If we go to a purely nonprofit and they do all 
uh, that's that they're getting funding from the state or elsewhere. What's the? I think the difference. What you're saying is the speed or the or uh, the reliability of having not to go through a year delay. And for that, you you you're willing to do eighty percent more affordable housing. So what would justify them to uh, make less profit or no profit because um, if it took so many units to equal affordable units and you're saying it's 100% affordable, then what's their incentive to do that besides just getting more speed and having a reassurance that it's going to go through? I believe most 40B projects go through. It may be delayed because some of the towns might fight it because they're they're um, usurping the zoning, uh, some of the zoning criteria. But that's a carrot and stick thing there, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure how this is going to encourage more. I want more. I'm just trying to figure out how we can craft this in a way where we can encourage more. I don't know for certain. Honestly, I think my proposal is probably a bit more aimed at making it easier for the uh, nonprofits to just easily build developments rather than about private developers. Because at least back when I was uh, several years ago, when I was crunching numbers and looking at various specific locations, uh, I estimated that there were a few properties that you might be able to pull this off and it, it is really pretty close to break even. Honestly, I'm not sure unless we raise the uh, numbers they can be sold at uh, that it's possible for a private developer to really make a good profit these days. But you know, I, I'm just trying to make incremental improvements to the system where I can. And I know it's not perfect, but something's better than nothing. I'm also concerned that uh, many of the some of the 40B developments, like uh, the one proposed in a, near Brattle Square, to me it seems more like a, essentially giving a, a large cash giveaway to the developer because allowing the higher density, I mean, higher density property is more valuable because it can hold more. And so it seems like you're essentially giving away a uh, million dollars to a developer to get them to build when it would be better to just directly build a fully affordable housing without using a private developer by uh, building something close to cost via nonprofits. I, I'll stop it there because I think we could debate this for a long time. I just was trying to get an understanding what you were trying to do with this article and where you're aiming it for. So you're more or less aiming this for nonprofit uh, developers to give them a uh, understanding of not having to be threatened by a long development process. Or so, yes. I mean, it's and possible private developers will be able to make use of it, but it's it's hard to get clear, crunchable numbers on the topic. And like I say, when I tried crunching the numbers 10 or so years ago, it was possible to, it would, be, would have been possible to make a private development, but the profit margins were pretty tight. And I'm not, and I don't think it would be possible to do that these days, given the price increases since then, uh, unless we raised the margins. But if we raise, but if we raised the price, the units that could be sold at, then it wouldn't, it wouldn't be fully affordable units, or we'd have to change it to say 100% of uh, AMI instead of 70%, uh, remembering the terms right. And I think it would be politically harder to get that passed in some ways, even though it would serve to expand the housing stock and would still represent housing that was more affordable than available in the past. Yeah, I'm just going to take it. Uh, You're all set? For now. Okay. Gene. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for filing this, as I think everyone on this board would say we are in favor of figuring out how to get more affordable housing in town. Um, 
I have, sorry. <clears throat> I have a number of questions. Uh, first one is this, as, as you probably know, the town is putting together a proposal, just started on this, to go to town meeting in the fall to meet what's called the MBTA community's requirements, which requires that the town have zoning that allows multifamily housing as of right in parts of the town. In addition, we've been told that the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is looking at putting in some sort of affordable housing overlay, I have no idea what it may be, for fall town meeting also. So my initial question is, why should we go ahead with this now rather than wait for fall town meeting to see what MBTA communities is going to look like and what the Affordable Housing Trust Fund overlay is going to look like? Because it sort of seems to me that depending on what MBTA communities does, what town meeting does, it may be the best place to put affordable housing in town. So I'm struggling with why we should do this now rather than wait till the fall. And I'm just wondering why you think we should do this now instead of waiting for the fall when those other things go into place and they may all, in my opinion, mesh a lot better. Honestly, that's probably better. You mostly, back when I filed this, I hadn't even heard about those things being uh, in process. Mm -hmm. And uh, once I found out, I mean, I'd already done most of the work and I'm just trying to finish my part of the process, get my proposal in, and then it can either, it can be used as a seed and merge with others or whatever. Yeah, my, my preference at this point, I'll hear what other people have to say, would be to have you work with the Affordable Housing Trust Fund on what they're proposing to put in and take the knowledge that you gained in putting this together to that process. So um, that's the first thing. And it sounds almost like that makes sense. Second is explain why the business district is a good place for affordable housing. We have a very small commercial base in town. Um, it, it adds taxes to the town. It gives places for people to walk to work, to shop, to restaurants, things like that. Explain why we should take away the business district, which is only a small percentage of the entire town's land, and make it available for affordable housing where most of the land in the town is not zoned business. I mean, I'm just trying to get affordable house. I mean, we, the affordable housing shortage has been around for a long time. I'm just trying to make it as available as possible. Should, should, should we care that we would lose business properties, that they might get converted? I mean, that, obviously, I mean, I can understand being concerned, but if it's if it's a choice between not having housing for people and businesses. Could we do both by doing this without doing just the business districts, which are mostly just right along Mass Ave, right along Broadway with a couple other little pieces. So basically, most of the town is zoned residential. So couldn't we accomplish the same thing and save the business districts? I don't know. I mean, that, that requires projecting to the future about where developers will build. Another practical note is that uh, the business districts, due to where it's located, tends to have better support for density in a way because it's right along all the transit routes. And of course, I'm envisioning many of these developments would have few people with cars. And if you don't have a car, for instance, getting groceries is difficult. But it's a lot easier to get groceries if you're really near the supermarkets. For like, instance. like I agree. Like right off Mass Ave, right off Broadway. That was one of my other concerns. I'll ask you about that next. You mentioned in one of your comments that you expected most people wouldn't have cars, um, and that may well be the case. I'm not sure. 
why would we make available for affordable housing the parts of town that are nowhere near shopping, nowhere near transit? There are parts of town like that where people have to get in their car and drive to shop, you know, to go to Mass Ave, to get to transit. You may have heard the term 15-minute city or 15-minute neighborhood. The theory being that you could be within a 15-minute walk of shops and, you know, recreation, things like that. If we were to think of that concept for affordable housing, we would say there are lots of places in town where that would work, but there are also lots of places in town where that wouldn't work. When I used to um, represent people in public housing and in affordable housing decades ago, one of the things we were always looking at when they're proposing to site affordable housing is that it's near things like schools, shops, public transit, so people could get to school, get to doctor, get to work. So I'm wondering why you've made it the entire town when there are clearly parts of the town where that's not doable. Mostly it's that way just to be generic and assume, I assume that the developers would find it appropriately. So if they're building a spot that's far from most of those mm -hmm. things, then they make sure they have enough parking because the people who are gonna go there are gonna, the only people who would choose to live there are gonna be people who have, have cars. You, you know that there's such a wait list for affordable housing that people will apply to get into affordable housing whether they have a car or not. One of the important things zoning does is say, we need to plan and make some decisions about where things go so things work well and poorly. You even mentioned that in here, in a couple of places, like we don't want people living right next to a factory, things like that. It's the same thing about where, in my opinion, we put in affordable housing. And you're saying, let's rely on the developer to do the right thing. No, I'm not saying let's rely on the developer to do the right thing. I'm okay. saying let's assume that the market will, at least to an extent, factor in uh, how convenient the property is into its price. That will affect the kind of people who apply for it. And at a more basic level, my stance is that there's a growth, it's a gross failure that there isn't enough affordable housing. It's a question of fact affordable housing could have been trivially done 10 or 20 years ago for the entire town. It could still be done trivially if there was the political will for it. Affordable housing is basically a political problem that exists because people, regardless of what they say, do not in fact want affordable housing in their neighborhood for the most part. So the without having your zoning, the Housing Corporation of Arlington, which is the local nonprofit, that builds affordable housing, finished two fairly, fairly large, nice projects, Downing Square, Park Ave, and they're now proceeding on one on um, Sunnyside, and they're doing 40 Bs, but they're ones that the town's going to approve, so they don't need to go through all of those processes. So this doesn't prevent that sort of thing from going on at the moment. I wonder what your explanation is to why we need to do more if they've been pretty successful up to this point. Well, is there still a shortage of affordable housing in Arlington? And that's the reason? Well, yes. I mean, if okay. there's a shortage of affordable housing, it needs to be addressed. Okay. Can, can you explain for the district lot regulations, minimum lot size, front yard, side yard, how you came up with all of these numbers and how you know that the, that will incentivize bringing in affordable housing developers? Well, I don't know exactly. Roughly how I came up with that is by looking at the uh, existing structure limits and uh, in some, and if there was some room, 
weaken them a bit, you know, so maybe if it's a 15, lower it to 10, if that seems feasible in the area. You know, just basically just that, going through the tables and looking up whatever there already is and making it a little easier if possible. Okay. Um, I mean, I have a lot of detailed questions I won't ask. There are a lot of places where we need to add some definitions. We need to add some more pieces for this to make any sense um, if it goes through all together. But I won't get into that until we decide what we're going to do about it, because I'd be here a lot longer asking the questions I about that. An email, and I could answer them. Or if that's allowed, I don't know what the process is. Well, we'll see what we want to yes, do. Absolutely. Uh, Steve, go ahead. Hi. Hi, good evening, Tom. Um, first, I, I want to um, you know, commend you for the amount of work that you've put into this uh, to take a bylaw like ours apart. And you've, you've done a pretty thorough job at going through it. Um, you know, that, that takes a lot of effort, and I, I want to acknowledge that. Um, based on a lot of the comments in your draft, I think you're thinking about the right things um, in terms of um, making the process predictable, in terms of making it by right, and trying to avoid some of the, you know, the restrictive dimensional regulations that get in the way. Um, as a background, a couple of things that you, know, you should sort of realize about our, the history of our bylaw. So in the early 70s, around 1971, we you know, established a 20,000 square foot minimum lot size to build an apartment building. Apartment building being, uh, it was three units, three or more dwellings at the time, now it would be considered four. Two years later in 1973, we established a two year moratorium on apartment construction. And, you know, then redid the bylaw in 1975. That one of the bigger effects of that was removing a significant portion of the business districts, which was primarily where apartments were allowed. So, while I I understand there's a you know taking starting with what's there is a very natural way to you know for, take a first step and proceed, but there's still a good portion of our bylaw that is largely oriented. You know, or does does not readily permit multifamily housing in general, and and that is you know like one of the one one of the obstacles to to get around. Um, I do agree with staff that I think an overlay district would be simpler than rewriting the base zoning, um, and just you know in terms of other overlay districts that I've seen, you could you could simply say, you know, in the affordable housing overlay district, um, you know. FAR is limited at two for the uh, for developments in the R0, R1, and R2 district and does not apply otherwise. Lot area per dwelling unit does not apply. And it's it's a lot easier to, you know, you could do it a lot more concisely. Um, you know, I when, when Cambridge passed theirs, uh, it was over two years and one of, if I'm remembering correctly, on the order of tens of public meetings. Not that a city, you know, one person would be expected to do that, but it, it does take, um, you know, it does take a lot of work to get to work, to get all the details worked out. Um, but for, I don't really have any questions and I've had the advantage of uh, sending Tom one round of written feedback. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I saw that you, I noted that you took a few suggestions and I, I do appreciate that. Um, I think this is something that, you know, I, I, as a board, I think, believe we want to do this. I believe there's a lot of support for it in the town. Um, but I, I think there's, you know, given what we have coming up in the fall and, you know, just the need to get people on board with it, um, I really hope you would consider participating with the folks who are working on the affordable housing overlay because I think you'd have a lot to offer. Great. Thank, Thank you. you, Steve. Um, and, and I'll just add as, as well, I don't have any questions um, per se, but I just want to add a comment that I, I agree that um, I, I think 
that you've brought up a, a lot of really great points and in the questions that you still have for um, that were footnotes, I think that um, Kelly pulled out in the in the memo. There there are a lot of great questions that, in order for this to be something that would go to town meeting, still need to be addressed. And um, I I agree with Steve that by looking at morphing this into an overlay district so that it is more concise and easily digestible by the people that it's intended to to serve um, and to to use it would would certainly be my preference and um, I, I would hope that you would look for opportunities to, to be involved um, as, as the town and some of the, um, the study groups and um, commissions that are currently standing start working towards that for, for the fall is, is my personal preference. Um, any other questions for I have a comment Tom? on that. Part of the reason for not doing it as an overlay district is that it makes it easier to fine tune a lot of the details based on districts, uh, like the height requirements. Uh, I made sure the height requirements so that in any particular district, uh, it would only go up, the maximum height would only go up by five feet and half a story. And it's easier to tweak those numbers if it's done on a district by district basis. Now you could just have an overlay district and say, it's always whatever the standard is for that district plus five feet. But personally, I think it's actually clearer to just have them in the table because the fact of the matter is the only people who are actually reading the zoning code are uh, town governance and developers. Uh, I mean, I recognize an overlay district, a concise form does have make it easier to understand for uh, the town meeting members voting on it, but I think functionally you could pretty easily rough make a concise form that explains it to the town meeting members while still having the spelled out form in the zoning code and that they're functionally I think pretty identical right I mean I think fundamentally the other thing that I have a concern about is that this only speaks to fully affordable developments when I think in the, if we looked at an overlay district we'd look at opportunities for um, increased percentage as opposed to, to fully. But that's, again, my, my particular point of view. Um, and I think at this point, what I'd like to do is see if there are any other questions from the board. We'll obviously come back again and see if there are any after public comment. And then I'd like to open it up to public comment, and then we can have you know, another discussion. We won't have our full discussion this evening. Um, we'll save that for the, for the 20th. But any other questions? Yes. <coughs> the basic process with the developer going in front of the redevelopment board. Mm -hmm. There seems like no reason for that as I saw it because all the redevelopment board is saying whether it meets the requirements for affordability. So I'm not really understanding the need as you see it for the developer to even go in front of the redevelopment board. Honestly, I didn't really want that part. I was including it. Uh, it's fundamentally similar to the Cambridge process, actually. If I, under, if I read the Cambridge process right, the uh, meeting with their, I forget which board it is in Cambridge, it, it's strictly advisory. And all the developer has to do is show up, listen to the meeting, and that's, you know, there's two or three meetings, but they just show up and they can ignore all the advice and they still satisfy the requirements. Uh, honestly, it's just meant to be a place to allow public feedback on the project so that the town and various abutters can say something. Honest, personally, I would rather go, not have it entirely because I think like the Cambridge case, mm -hmm. having a purely optional rule or having a rule that says you have to do this, but you don't have to actually listen to any of the advice is pointless but apparently Cambridge decided to have one anyways. And then the public would come and say something and then we can't do anything. So it seems like something wrong with that, in my opinion. On the utility capacity piece, those are things beyond the control of the redevelopment board. That's the Department of Public Works and the maps and things like that. So the, the, the board could not see to the creation and maintenance of those things 
because they're beyond our purview. They're not, <laughs> they're not something that we can do. That would have to be directed to the Department of, of yeah. Public Works rather than us. I'm pretty sure I put in some notes about that, about the, whether the well, this is one of my overall problems. There are so, even if I agreed with this, there are so many things in here that need to be fixed. We, I can't see taking it to town meeting with so many problems. This even says on one place, it calls us a planning board. It says the city staff or a town. From those little things yeah, to well, really big picture things, I don't see how we could take it. To That's town what I was kind of hoping town council would have gotten back to me at some point. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, I totally agree with Jean what you're saying there, okay? But I'm going to ask you when you come back, uh, it seems like you want to come back and push this forward. Okay? You have to answer my original question better and make me comfortable with it, okay? By enacting this zoning, what does it do to encourage more affordable housing, okay? I think you're saying streamlining it or making it more, um, um, I don't know, um, I forgot the word you said, sir. I'm, I'm sorry about that. I don't remember what I said. Okay, but on your other thing, it sort of contradicts it too. So, you know, I just come back with, with like a, maybe a one or two sentence. By doing this, this is what I'm trying to do. And if I get that, I can get behind other things. And then we can talk about some of the changes that Gene has and all that stuff that I totally agree with. But right now, I don't even understand the, what you're trying to do here. Are you, you're trying to increase affordable housing but how are you doing that? Well, the, the short answer would be, for example, there was a property, uh, when I was looking at properties, uh, where basically there was a good house with a pretty decent backyard uh, near the 78 bus line, I think. And uh, based on the price I calculated it, this was 10 or so years ago, uh, it could be chopped up into eight single room occupancy building, single room occupancy rooms with about, that would, uh, well, it would have a sale price equivalent to about 100,000. And then uh, about four additional uh, three bedroom, two or three bedroom units would be built in the cluster in the backyard. Basically it's designed, the purpose is to let things like that be built. So you're trying to increase density. Yes, it's basically increasing density. To say density. it. That yes. By I thought that was pretty clear. I guess it wasn't. No. That's basically what it's doing, yes. And I, I would wish you would get some more current numbers. I, I don't think saying 10 years ago I did a study like this. I, I realized it, but you're asking a lot here. And I think you really need to talk to realtors and other developers and see what they see talk to the housing trust and see how they go about finding their property what are their hindrances i mean if you were saying you're gearing this toward a nonprofit, fine can you talk to a nonprofit and say hey what are some of your hurdles you have in town that's preventing you from developing here then i then i would I would say, okay, you have a point, but you, you're just saying, I haven't talked to anybody because I don't know anybody. It doesn't satisfy me right now. And also- I, I agree, I think that that's the engagement piece. Yeah. Yes, and then the other thing is, I don't want to use facts that are 10 years old. It, it's just not gonna make sense. I'm sorry about that, sir. That's fine. I mean, honestly, the fact is, I'm ultimately doing this just because I think it, the town needs affordable housing. I was trying to do something, but Ultimately, I applaud you for that. My family is well off, and none of this actually matters for me. So, it's it's basically purely out of trying to get something done on an issue which, as again, has languished for a long time. And in point of fact, like I say, it could be trivially fixed if there was political will for it. So it's really a political problem, and I'm actually bad at solving political problems. I'm just 
trying to write better regulations. Um, I think at this point, what I'd like to do is open um, the hearing up for public comment. So um, at this point, anyone who would like to provide um, the board with any feedback on this article, um, please raise your hand. I'll call on you. You'll have up to three minutes to address the board. Anyone? Um, and I'll remind anyone who speaks to please introduce yourself with your first, last name, and address. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chris Loretti, 56 Adam Street. You know, I appreciate the proponent bringing this forward and the work he's put into it. Um, and I appreciate the board's comment. I don't have a whole comment, so I don't have a whole lot, of add, lot to add. Um, you know, the top level comment is clearly this is not ready for prime time. Um, I was initially confused about just who's, whose article this was because the language of the proposed vote or possible bylaw changes was written by the staff as opposed to the proponent. Um, and the proponent himself, if you look, read all the footnotes, had a whole bunch of questions about how things should be done. So it, it, it's just really not ready to go before town meeting. And I can't see it becoming ready in, what, six weeks before town meeting starts. Um, you know, there are a few particular things I had problems with. Um, one was the reduction of the affordability requirements of our town bylaw and the possibility of these affordable units not even counting on the state inventory of affordable units. Um, I find you know, both of those unacceptable. I also find the reduction in the open space requirements of the bylaw unacceptable. Um, you know, I think it's a great idea to have compensation for abutters, um, but I think that's problematic, and I don't know how you would work that. Um, and I'm, I'm a little bit perplexed about the language of the article itself talks about doing this by right, but the process that's described to me doesn't sound like by right. If it's coming to an advertised public hearing before the redevelopment board, and I thought I read in the, in the language of the vote that you might actually be able to vote up and down on it. Well, that sure doesn't sound like a by right development to me. Um, and in my you know, final comment was exactly the same as Mr. Lowes's. We have a state law called 40B. Why in the world would a developer go this route that the proponent's you know, proposing rather than a 40B development if they want to get around the zoning restrictions? Um, and I think as the board's noted, this is a significant change. And these types of changes take lo a long time and they take a lot of public input. Um, and frankly, I think they should be coming from the board or for other town bodies that, that specialize in this kind of thing. Um, and so as, as admirable as the intentions might be, you know, this article really isn't it and it's really not ready for this town meeting. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, any other members of the public uh, wish to make comment on this article? Okay, uh, so at this point, I'll turn it over for um, any other questions or comments from the board. We'll start with Steve. No, I, I understand the motivation. Um, Cambridge, when they adopted their affordable housing overlay, um, it was envisioned as something that were as accommodating projects that would be done primarily with um, subsidies by nonprofit developers. And uh, they wanted to provide an alternative path, permitting path, um, rather than 40B. Um, you know, the first year that bylaw or that ordinance, sorry, Cambridge is a city, so it's an ordinance. The first year the ordinance was in effect, they put something like 350 dwellings in the pipeline. So, it, I mean, it, at least it seems to have been effective, though I, I, I understand, I have a vague understanding that there have been some hiccups that need to be straightened out, like you know, any other comprehensive piece of legislation. Um, yeah, that's it. Gene? Um, so, you know, you'll get to come back in two weeks when we um, take a vote. So I would just ask if you would consider whether this is the course you'd pursue or the better course would be to meet up with the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and, and try to work with them so that there's a a package that goes to town meeting in the fall. Um, Kim. I would echo what Jean said. I, um, that's all I have to say. And I would also um, say that I, I have similar thoughts to, to Jean. I, I, would, I would really encourage you to, to think about um, whether the, the best course of action is to continue down this path or to um, um, seek engagement with some of the, the groups who are working on the proposed overlay district for the fall. 
And I will say that if they come here in the fall and they haven't done any public process, we'll be asking them about that too. Great. Any questions? Okay, great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so at this point, I'd like to move to uh, the discussion around article, the proposed Article 29 zoning bylaw amendments for downtown business parking minimums. And I'd like to invite James Fleming to join us here at the front. Welcome back, James. How do I know if it's working? It's you're good. We have a thumbs up from our um, technical expert in the back here. And before you start, I'm actually going to ask Kelly to see if she has any. I was going to thank that guy. Oh, okay. You can thank him. <laughs> so much, uh, Kelly. Sure. Um, so just. Two things to note on this. Um, the first is that this only affects the B5 district, and the B5 district is basically a little bow tie shaped district that's right in Arlington Center um, at about 26 parcels. So, what this really would do is um, it'd have a very limited scope. Um, and, and also, note that I think, as Mr. Fleming has shared with the board before, is that this really only affects uh, commercial properties. So if somebody was doing a mixed use development, it would not adjust the parking requirements for the residential component of the development. It only affects the commercial portion of the development. Um, the second thing to note is that um, we believe in having talked with our economic development coordinator, there's a business friendly aspect to this. So because it, we have seen in this past year proposals that have come before the board for a change of use, um, not in the B5 actually, but in other districts. And the change of use is the only thing, the, the, require, the need to require parking is the only thing that makes the applicant have to come before the board. So if you have a property, for example, that is, there's a tenant who's seeking to open a restaurant in an existing building, they're not doing any construction, um, but they're just seeking to do a change of use. And if they don't have parking and they they obviously don't have the ability to create parking because they're leasing a space. Um, they still have to come before the board to request that parking waiver. So if something like that happened in the B5 district under this amendment, um, that would basically circumvent that and make it a little bit easier for restaurants or, or other property or other uses that require greater parking requirements to um, open up without having to pay that additional fee and the, the two months it takes to legally advertise the hearing and then um, turn around the decision. Um, and then I think finally it is, um, we noted that this is consistent with the master plan, the Arlington Heights Neighborhood Action Plan, which actually doesn't apply in this case, um, but it, consistent with some of the recommendations and then the sustainable transportation plan. Great, thank you so much, Kelly. So James, I'll turn it over to you. If you could introduce yourself first, last name and address, and then anything you'd like to um, note for the board. I'm not sure if you wanted to take us through your um, PowerPoint. Yeah, okay, so great. James Fleming, 58 Oxford Street. Um, oh, fantastic. Great, and if I could ask that you just um, project a little bit for the folks here um, to get up and over the HVAC system. Thank you. <laughs> well, unfortunately, that that's, just for our, our groups from ACMI, for those of us in the room, we'll just need to project a little bit. Thank you. All right, sounds good. Um, could I go to the um, So uh, this is just an overview for anyone who doesn't know what the parking minimum is. Um, it's basically, if you have a business, there's some requirement that you provide parking, and it depends on the business. Sometimes it's based on floor area, sometimes it's based on the number of seats in like a restaurant, for example. Um, in this case, the example that I'm gonna reference the rest of this, thank you is, uh, is uh, the general retail, which is you need a parking space per 300 square feet of uh, floor space for the business. So hold on to that number in your mind for a minute. Next, please. Thank you. Um, this proposal would remove that parking requirement um, for businesses in the B5, which is, I don't know, I like what I consider the downtown. Um, and it would apply in cases where uh, a business changes over and you would have a greater parking requirement uh, or you have a redevelopment of some sort that involves a commercial use. And in that case, the applicant will either be able to claim a nearby public parking lot, which in this case would be the Russell Common Lot, or they would be able to work directly with staff to uh, come up with the details of a TDM plan, and there would be no need to go through this board for a review. Um, so why this matters to me is that um, the parking space is also about 300 square feet, 
for space. Um, so back to the 300 square feet of floor area for one parking space. So this is one of the example blocks. I think this one actually is technically B3, so you just imagine. Um, so one parking space for 300 square feet of fun stuff means that half of your space is parking. Next, please. So I look at that as if this had to comply with the parking lot, that would be a lot of stuff to lose. And that doesn't seem like a good outcome for the town or for people who want to do fun stuff in town. Um, next, please. Uh, it's also unnecessary because, as you can see here, a lot of the businesses in downtown don't have their own dedicated parking, and in general, we all just tend to use the common parking lot. Um, and that isn't really a problem for a couple of reasons. Next, please. The first is that we have um, the circle dots of the bus stops, so we have means of getting there without a car. Um, and then the other is the Minuteman bike path, so people can bike to where they get, or you can bike up and down Mass Ave. So not having everyone arrive in a car means that you already have in infrastructure in place for reducing demand for car parking. Next, please. Um, the second is that we have paid on-street parking, which is shown in orange here, and we have a number of paid parking lots, which are shown in red, um, which the paid parking lowers demand for parking because people don't like to pay for parking. So it encourages you to get in and get out so that someone else can take your place. That's also good for business because more turnover means more different customers for businesses, and just parking and sitting there for eight hours doesn't necessarily mean you're contributing eight hours worth of your time to patronizing businesses. Maybe someone would. Next, please. Um, this is just visual of what the B5 is. It's just that couple blocks in downtown Arlington Center. Next, please. Um, in terms of details, uh, so the first detail is that we already have a section 619D, which says that um, applicants can come before the board and get the public parking lot as a substitution for their parking if they're close enough to the space, in this case, 1,000 feet. And so this, um, this article would make that provision just by right for um, B5 uses. So if someone opens a new business right next to the parking lot, then they just get to claim this by right. If you have something that isn't within 1,000 feet, um, then the, uh, the other option is that they have to do what's currently under, I don't have the section here, it's the TDM section, basically. If you have, you have to do three of, one of the following, three of the following things, and then you can, you, that counts as your mechanism for reducing parking demand. Um, this is also something that they come before the board as is today, and this would also become a by-right process with this uh, article. Um, uh, the, the last question is, why can the businesses that we have today exist without requiring parking? And the answer is that the bylaw has both of those mechanisms in place that we just saw to allow applicants to open so that we don't lose our commercial space without having to have them actually create the parking. So both of those mechanisms are by special permit today. And those are plans are reviewed by the ARB and then subsequently by town staff. Next, please. Um, and the change in this proposal is really to just make them by right and with administrative staff review which is what has happened for, I think, the majority of TDM plans that have come before this board, with, I think, the exception of one in the industrial district. Um, that, Steve, I think, actually, you, you you picked on the showers. Yes, I did. <laughs> um, so it seems that there's pre there's precedent, for, there's precedent for the TDM plan details, mostly going to the staff, just please provide one, and then you can get your, um, your waiver. And so this just makes that happen naturally. Um, in summary, uh, under this proposal, B5 businesses, uh, get, they have to do the same things as they would do other, under special permit today. It's just that uh, now they get to under review with town staff. The difference is that the process is a little bit faster. I think it's about two months for a, um, a special permit from the advertising and then the, the hearing with the board and then coming back for the decision. And this matters to me again because we need businesses to open in Arlington. And the easier it is for them to open, the more likely it is that we're going to get things that we want. That's all I have. Thank you for listening. Great. Thank you so much, James. Uh, we'll start with him for any comments. Uh, well, I would comment and uh, say... Or questions. James, you're doing really well now. Uh, I remember the first time you came here. Oh, well, and, I was nervous. And we, where you are now, and uh, <laughs> this looks really good. Uh, I'm supportive of this, and I'm going to do what uh, a Gene comment. I just want to uh, change a couple of words. Um, your proposal there? Sure. Applicants can show availability of nearby parking and provide a plan to reduce. I don't think that we either do either or claim. It, it just, just, it's, sure. It's just there. I mean, um, they, they don't have to do that. Is, is that language, I don't have the motion in front of me. Is that actually in the main motion? 
I, I know it's in your proposal. Oh God, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm yeah. trying to I, I, enhance your proposal better. Sure. Yeah. It's gonna, you're gonna. This is gonna be the cell you're gonna show. Sure. Um, the the main motion text is basically, it's basically me copying and pasting six one ninety and the TDM plan just in one in one place. Yeah, I'm fine with that. And, okay. And I'm supportive of uh, reducing parking for business. I think uh, you, Thank you you hit a good uh, spot here. Great. Thank you, Ken. Gene. So I, I was reminded when you complimented Steve on the one in the industrial district. Was that a compliment? The showers. <laughs> <laughs> you should take Reference. it as a compliment. Yep. That, that we also ended up requiring changes to the parking mm -hmm. there too. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not clear to me that we don't serve any purpose whatsoever. Take the restaurant we approved a couple of months mm -hmm. ago the Fat Greek, where well, among the other things that we did, which wouldn't have happened if there was just administrative approval, we got them to change the direction that the exhaust went so it wouldn't point at residences. And uh, so they put some filtration on it. We had them do something other than what they were going to do with the garbage, was just put it out on the sidewalk with everyone else's garbage and the light above the entrance. So I think there's a trade-off to be had here between coming to this board so we can do things like that and not coming to this board to save a couple months time. And we asked this of James a couple of years ago on another one of his articles, and that is, can you give us any examples of a business that hasn't come here simply because this current situation is in place. Sure. I and, think that's a question. Oh, is that a question yeah. for James? Okay. Um, I, of course I don't know. Right, right. Um, and the other thing is I think public process and public openness is very important in what we do and what the town does. And when an applicant has to submit a transportation demand management plan to the ARB. It's a public document. Everyone sees it if they want to see what the ARB is up to. It's in, the, it's in the agenda. They can come to our meeting. They can comment on it. If it's an administrative approval and it simply goes to the staff, and I'm not saying they wouldn't do a good job, but there's no public process. It then becomes a black box. And I'm really, really hesitant to do anything that reduces public transparency. That's right. Thank you, Gene. Uh, Steve. Uh, thank you for bringing this forward, Mr. Fleming. I, I think it's a reasonable for, given the limited nature of it, that it only applies to the B5 district, there is a there are several large parking lots in the vicinity. And um, I, I do, I, I think I might take the side of the town economic development coordinator and see this as more of a business friendly uh, measure. So I, I'm supportive of this. Thank you, Steve. Um, I just have two comments. And again, we won't get into d discussion or debate here. Jean, I hear what you're saying there. Um, my question is whether or not we should rely on parking to bring people here if there are more things we, we want to see. That's something I, I think we should talk about um, in, the, in the future. I think as a proposal, um, this seems reasonable to, to me. I think, again, if we get into wordsmithing the way that it's particularly written here, one of the things that I think might be helpful rather than to repeat what's in I think it's actually 6.1.10D. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is fine. Yeah, whatever that um, is. But I might actually prefer to reference as required in 6.1.10D as opposed to restate what's in that. Sure. Um, so I, I, I'd ask you to, to take a look at that um, sure. before coming back on the, on the 20th. Sure. One of the reasons I hadn't is that I, I think it's either that section or the TDM one that explicitly references to be reviewed to be reviewed by a special permit granting authority, and in this case, it goes by right, and so, yep. the, like, 
I, I could try and do the insertion, and that was why I was thinking originally, but I think it made more sense to sort of short circuit that and just reference the language. It, maybe there's a different yeah, way to I'll do take it. another look at that again, too. Um, I'm just trying to look for one of the things that we try and do when... Duplicate language. Right, exactly. Oh, no. The duplicative I, oh, language oh, no. I, really I is a sticking point. <laughs> I understand. I completely understand. Okay, great. But yep. I think overall I'm um, we, supportive we can work on that. Okay, great. Any other um, questions or comments for um, for James before we open it up for public comment? All right. Is there anyone who wishes to um, make any comments related to this proposal? Please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, Chris Loretti, uh, 56 Adam Street. My, my take on this article is that it's completely unnecessary. Um, I think it's notable that neither the proponent nor the staff could identify one example where this has caused a problem, you know, in the bylaw as it currently exists. Um, I think bylaw changes should be made to, ex to address real problems, not hypothetical ones. And I think it, also think it's notable that I don't see anyone here from the business community asking for this change. As has been noted, the ARB can already allow um, you know, the use of the public parking spaces within a thousand feet uh, of any of these um, properties or, or businesses to qualify for the off-street parking requirement or off-site or on-site parking requirement. Um, and it's also, you should also note that the entirety of this B5 district falls within that thousand square feet. So um, the whole business about transportation demand management plans is utterly irrelevant. The TDM, I mean, the, the existing parking lots in the center is all you need to grant um, you know, the exception to the on-site parking requirement. Um, I would also agree with Mr. Um, Benson that if you're going to allow an exception to the bylaw, that's a policy decision, and it's one that your board should be making. It should not be made by staff. Um, and, and my final point is that when these changes, change in use occur, in districts like this, they almost always come before the board anyway. Um, it's very rare that they don't come before the board. Um, and if they do come, if they don't come before the board, it's like a situation like with um, the dun donut, dun donut diner place where there's no change in use and there's no change in the requirements. But when you actually change the use, um, and if there's any construction you change the use, the bylaw says it has to come before the board anyway for a special permit if it would have required a special permit, you know, as, as new construction. So um, as they say in town meeting, this is a solution in search of a problem, and I hope you won't support it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments related to this article? All right. Uh, seeing none, I will turn it back over to the board for any final questions for Mr. Fleming, starting with Steve. Uh, nothing further. Jean? Nothing. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Yep. And uh, we'll on get you started the, for the next on one. On to the next one. All right. Um, so before we um, move to that one, that is Article 30, um, also inserted by the request of James Fleming and 10 registered voters for a zoning bylaw amendment related to one and two family usable open space. I will first turn it over to Kelly for um, any comments from the Department of Planning and Community Development. Sure. Thank you, Rachel. Um, to note in this, um, as we described in the memo, this affects the R0, R1, and R2 properties, um, which are low density zoning districts. Um, basically in the zoning bylaw right now, there exists a number of ways that open space is created and some of them are duplicative um, and some of them sort of, they, they don't build on each other, but they're just sort of more extreme than the other. So, you know, we have uh, front yard setbacks, side yard, rear yard setbacks, maximum lot coverage, landscaped open space, and usable open space. Um, we did a we did a scan of a budding zone, uh, zoning by, zoning ordinances and bylaws of abutting communities, and realized that out of out of our abutting communities, a number of them don't even require open space. They rely on the setbacks as um, sort of that provision of open space is based on the setbacks. Um, in Arlington, the definition of open space requires that for something to be considered usable, it has to be at least 25 feet by 25 feet. So what that does, and because that provision in the zoning bylaw was basically applied retroactively to a lot of existing properties, um, we have, it creates a lot of nonconformities. 
um, because there have a lot of properties where the the usable open space is either is neither flat enough nor um, nor does it have the the 25 by 25 foot square in the backyard in order for a property to meet that requirement. Um, I think as the board has discussed at other meetings where we've discussed open space, the landscaped open space and usable open space is also tied to gross floor area, um, which is very unusual in comparison to other um, other zoning uh, zoning from other communities. Um, because what this does is every time you add a square foot of residential floor area, you also have to add a square foot of, or you have to add a proportion of that as usable or landscaped open space. And that's you cannot necessarily create more land on a property. Um, and so what the zoning bylaw, um, what our master plan seeks to do or what the master plan has prescribed is that whenever zoning amendments are or whenever the zoning is amended, you should not create more nonconformities. Um, and then in wherever possible, we should seek to simplify the zoning bylaw for usability. Um, and overall, I think this, the applicant or the petitioner has explored a number of opportunities, really looking at reducing some of the redundancy and how open space is created. And so this is, um, I, I think he has a presentation that sort of describes the process that he followed in order to get to that. Uh, James, I will turn it over to you. All right. James Lang, 58 Oxford Street, again. Um, perfect, thank you. Um, before I start the presentation, I will note, this sounds like I'm getting rid of backyards. That is not what this is intended to be. So keep that in your mind as we go through this because it's not intuitive. Um, so usable open space is a, it's a continuous amount of space that each building has to have minimum of 25 by 25. The important point is this does not mean green nor pervious. It can be a swimming pool and it can be a bocce court like my neighbor did a couple of years ago. He has no backyard, no green space, but it's still usable open space. Um, the stated purpose in the bylaw is that it's for enjoyment by the residents. Um, so as an example, you can see there's a 30 by 30 square foot of usable open space in red there. So that's more than 25 on a side, that counts. But the orange space next to it does not count because it's got 20 feet on one side instead of the minimum 25. Next, please. So this proposal is to remove this requirement uh, for one and two family homes. So you don't prevent them from creating it if they uh, want it, but you also don't require them to have it. Next, please. Um, Kelly already mentioned this. Um, uh, most of the towns don't have this concept at all of a minimum dimensioned uh, square in the backyard. Um, Medford has something that's similar. It's not exactly the same. It's 15 feet with an additional 10 foot setback. So it's, it's kind of close. Um, but theirs does not theirs does not apply to one and two family uses. It only applies to three family and up. And so this proposal would sort of make us like Medford in that respect. Uh, the other thing is that this won't really have an effect everywhere. Um, in particular, if you are a conforming single family home, you already have a 25 foot setback and a 60 foot minimum lot width. So you, by definition, have a 20 by 60 square of usable open space minus your driveway. So their front yard will always be that space. So the real, the real place where this uh, comes into play is in the two-family neighborhoods and older one-families where you were built too close to the street to be 25 feet. Um, and in this case, your usable open space would only be in the backyard as is shown here with a minimum of, with a 20-foot front yard setback. Perfect. Um, so the reason, the reason this matters to me is that um, this is, makes it uh, hard to adapt old buildings. So the main issue is that the requirement gets bigger as you increase the amount of living space, but your lot size is fixed. So if you run up against that limit, then you're kind of out of luck. Um, uh, next, please. So as an example, and I will acknowledge, these are all contrived examples to illustrate a point. There are thousands of lots. I didn't go searching for one and the records are limited anyways. So this is an example of a house that is sort of just barely under the limit. They need uh, 810 square feet of uh, usable open space. Um, or so they have 810, but they need 795. So they're kind of like just under that limit. And in the next few slides, we'll see why that's a problem for them. Next piece. So as an example, suppose you don't have a back porch and you want to add one. So this is a relatively small porch, five feet. Um, you can't add it because it makes your backyard space non-usable. So that takes you from uh, conforming to not conforming, which under no circumstances can you do. You do have to get a variance. I doubt you're going to get a variance in this case because it's probably a flat backyard. 
So even though this is a small scale addition, it can't be done because you can't create nonconformities. Um, the next one is suppose they don't have um, a full uh, half story on top and they want to add some square feet in the attic. Um, again, you're right under the limit. So if you add that living space, your requirement for usable open space goes up. But again, you cannot create additional open space because your lot size is fixed. So again, relatively small scale addition, but you're going from uh, 795 requirement to 840. You only have 810. It's creating a nonconformity. It wouldn't be allowed. Um, one thing that I noticed, this is sort of unfair if, you, if your home is already nonconforming. So there's a section in the bylaw, um, in the nonconforming section, which is basically if you are nonconforming, you can make dormer additions in, within the boundary of the property by right, and the usable open space dimension doesn't come into play. But in that case, this house is actually bigger than the one before by about one foot, so it's slightly over the limit of being non-conforming. So this house could do a full set of dormers without any review at all, but our previous example couldn't add even a small dormer. So that strikes me as very, very unfair. Now granted, I know I'm picking examples. This is meant to illustrate the point that if you happen to find yourself in that situation of being up against the limit, you can't do something that you might see your neighbors doing and they might be able to do it. Next please. And it's particularly unfair because knowing this in advance requires you to have done basically a survey of the property, which you don't own, so you can't do it. Um, or you would have to measure all of these things yourself and no one's going to do that. And you'd have to do that before you buy the house. So I think that, that, that just seems very unfair to me. And I think it's unfair because this requirement shouldn't prevent you from making small scale additions to your house. We already have a provision in the bylaw for large additions. I think it's 750 square feet or so. So big changes are reviewed and based on the ZBA cases that I've seen, the neighbors seem to, seem to care about the size of the addition relative to the house. So in that sense, that seems a reasonable thing to do, but if it's an incremental addition that runs up against this limit, it doesn't. It seems sort of arbitrary. Next, please. So uh, the obvious question is, why did I choose to remove it instead of just making it a little easier? Um, so I looked at a couple options for a modification, um, reducing the percentage, which is set at 30%, or changing the minimum dimension to 20 feet. Uh, or to base it on a fixed thing like the lot area or some combination of the above. Um, no matter which way I tried doing things, I would. There was, no search, there was no situation in which I wouldn't create the possibility of some other problem happening. Um, an example here is um, reducing the, uh, lot, the requirement from 30% to 25%. The simplest example is that the porch takes the requirement to zero or takes the, um, the usual open space to zero percent. So I would have, in this case, this is a case I would really want to see allowed. Um, reducing the percentage is just not going to work. Um, I didn't include all the possibilities because that would make the slide deck very long. There is a memo attached if you care to see more. Um, I went tried to go through a process to see if there was an alternative that didn't create nonconformities or try to accomplish what I wanted, and there wasn't one. So here we are. Um, and this is where my opinion comes in is that Usable is subjective. I think a driveway is very usable if you have a basketball hoop and you want to shoot hoops. That is extremely usable space. Um, the other thing is that this space, the usable open space definition doesn't mean green. It doesn't have any provision for that. So my neighbor's, my neighbor's bocce court counts. He's very happy with it. Um, and if you're buying a house, you don't have to buy it if you don't like the yard. You just wait for the next one. And if you're doing something like adding a porch and you're removing your backyard space, you've already decided that that's better for your needs. So uh, you should be allowed to make that trade-off. Um, and then lastly, Kelly already mentioned it, so I won't belabor the point, other dimensional controls. Um, lot coverage, I think, is the most, uh, the most uh, relevant one. Um, this is an example of a house from a ZBA hearing that was at the limit of usable open space, or just over the limit of usable open space, and also over, just over the lot coverage requirement. So this is sort of a visual example of a house that is limited by the lot coverage and not and not by the or and by the usable open space. Um, and based on the setbacks, you will always have some sort of yard space. It's just a question of, you know, do you have a square in the backyard as the as your mechanism to do it? Next. Um, in summary, it would remove the requirement. Um, I think this is fine because we have a town next door to us that doesn't require this for one and two family homes and they haven't imploded. Um, and that it had this requirement can limit adapting old homes in some respect. Sorry, sorry, that was long. Thank you. No, thank you very much. 
I appreciate it. Um, question for you. Um, did you, I believe you had the opportunity to review this with the CBA. I, I wanted did. to see if they um, provided any feedback for you. They, uh, they did. Um, do you want my interpretation of it or do you, they have legal mini meeting minutes, I think. That you're if you could, I mean, we'll, we'll review those, but if you would be sure. so kind as to summarize, that would be helpful. Sure. So, um, so inspectional services made a change in the fall of last year where if you are making an addition within the confines of the existing footprint and you're non-conforming, it's by right. So that was, that's the majority of the cases. So this, they thought this will apply to a very small number of cases where you happened to be either have usable open space or you're trying to make an addition like just outside your footprint anyways, which they don't tend to see a lot of anyways. So they think it's not gonna really affect things one way or the other. Okay, great. Thank you. Cool. Uh, we'll start with Steve actually on this one. Okay, uh, thank you again for bringing this. Um, it's sort of funny. There's our op yeah our open space requirements are kind of are a little interesting. Um, essentially, it's the reciprocal of FAR, but with a couple of things taken out of the numerator, and you know it does overlap with you know the front yard setback. Um, you that's a perfectly you know it's it happens to align with it, which also kind of. I've always wondered about, but never don't know exactly how that 25 foot number was chosen. In fact, I've read pretty much all of the ZBA minutes from, you know, the year prior to the bylaw rewrite in the seventies. And one of the things I was kind of curious about is, well, where did this concept come from? Um, I don't recall finding much helpful, but um, neither here nor there. The, one of the interesting things about it is it does sort of create three categories of properties where um, there are ones with no usable open space at all and the bylaw just doesn't, you know, the regulations just don't apply to them because you go from 0% to 0% and it's no change in the degree of nonconformity. Um, you have uh, conforming lots where, you know, the front yard setback in our, in you know, the single family districts more or less guarantees guarantees that you're going to get it. Um, and then you have ones like the examples that you showed where it's conforming, but just barely. And, you know, the difference between a house, a, a, a property that's conforming and able to make an addition, uh, not able to make an addition, and one that's non-conforming and can make an addition um, can be very slight. And it's not intuitive at all. I've kind of wondered periodically, like, how could we make this better? Um, and, you know, you raise a point of, well, pretty much everything you try to do, you run into creating other problems. And that's sort of the same thing I, I came, came to. Um, overall, I think this is, I, I do agree that our definition of open space is, is somewhat dated in terms of what it's trying to achieve. Um, I would like to see us have something in terms of, you know, that stress things like, you know, that, you know, maybe align more with community values in terms of pervious surface or pollinators or actual green space. Um, but I don't, um, you know, that's, you know, this can be done one step at a time. So I I'm supportive of this. Great. Thank you, Steve. Jean. Yes, thank you for bringing this forward. You make a compelling case. My one question is, this would also apply to brand new construction. And does it, does it make sense to apply it to brand new construction since all of your examples are things that are not, you know, that don't seem to work with existing houses, but if somebody's going to build a new house, um, why not have them use, put in the usable open space and just limit this to existing? Just complexity, just why, why have a different requirements apply? Actually, one note is that the, the definition of usable open space is currently different for new construction houses. It's 20 by it's, 20. It's 20 by 20, right. which, which like, like, I see that and that's just another reason that I hate this requirement and it needs to go. It's, it's, it shouldn't be different for the different houses whether or not it's new construction or not. So 
in this case, in this respect, that'll just go from the definition. That was my only question. Okay, thank you very much. Ken. I remember this coming up several years back. Uh, when we, yes, when we did, uh, we started the zoning reconfiguration. Re You're on that, Jane? Only the end of it. Not the end. Okay. Um, and we this the, one of the, uh, this twenty five by twenty five and the twenty by twenty came up is what it's it's conflicting, and we tabled it at that time, and said that we'll get back to it and we're going to develop a um, housing guideline because we talked about all the things about curb cuts and front yard setbacks and all that stuff and we actually never got back to it. <laughs> so um, I'm here glad, I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're bringing some of the stuff back up again. Uh, we did. We have talked about this uh, in our um, um, retreats about um, what we're trying to address in the, in the future and so forth. And this is one of those. Uh, I, you are right. I'm glad you're bringing this stuff back up. Uh, I'm just wondering. This is one small change. Uh, should we look at this as a whole? And because um, I, I'm not saying I disagree. I, I totally disagree. I totally agree with you. But at one time we were looking at the whole of uh, design guidelines for uh, single and du duplexes like that. We never actually went back to it. But I was wondering something that we maybe get a group on that and we look at some of these things as a whole because there's all there's all sorts of things like uh, setbacks and on you know and right now we're doing incremental stuff like does the porch count as a uh, um, building footprint or is it enclosed there's all these things that have been sort of festering that's that uh, we should all address all at once so we have a idea of the whole thing that's the only thing I'm sort of bringing up right now I'm not saying I don't support this. Uh, if the rest of the board wants to go ahead and move this along, I'm not going to stop it. But I just want to say, should we look at this as a whole and make uh, make some time? And isn't uh, I'm not sure we can do it this this fall, but I think we should put it on the agenda. Um, I think the fact you're saying that this is a, a very minor occurrence that it's not holding much back or doing much of anything is sort of clarifying a lot of things for, for a few instances I, I've had to incorporate this in a bigger picture for this one. So, that's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question. I, I think that I'm certainly, one, I appreciate what you have to say about the more holistic view specifically to what is in front of us. Um, I'm certainly supportive of um, reducing something that I think is unnecessary and um, overly restrictive when there are other areas of the code which achieve um, the aim in a much clearer and um, well-defined way. My question is um, whether you contemplated um, the single family detached dwelling, two family duplex, et cetera, um, usable open space requirements in the business districts and removing that there as well, because it seems as it, that those would be in the same um, situation as those in the, in the residential districts. Um, so just curious as to whether or not that's something you contemplated. I had thought about it. Um, I left it out purely because it would make the main motion extremely long. Um, and also that I doubt that someone would voluntarily build a new two-family home in a business district when they could build something that's mixed use. So I, it seemed like it seemed a possible but very unlikely case that would happen. I un completely understand that. I think um, it, could, it could be done. Right. My, my preference for moving it forward would be to fix it, to do it everywhere ah, okay. if, if okay. we're going to fix it. And again, I, I need to look at the way, um, and I apologize that I, I didn't do this ahead of time, okay. the way that the um, 
that the article was originally written. I think it does constrain it to the art district. No, it doesn't. It doesn't? Does it? Yeah, it's... I sort of said to see if the town will amend the zoning bylaw to completely remove the open space requirement for one and two family uses. It doesn't say where the districts are. Right. So it that's, just says one and two family uses. Yeah. So that's that's where I'm. You'd rather see it done first. This this use in all possible districts. Personally, again, my, myself, and again, we can um, see if if others um, agree with that. But that's. That's where I um, sure. am, am coming from. I, I agree with it, but I'd, I'd rather fix it. Everywhere. We're going to fix it. I'd rather fix it everywhere all at once. Got it. Um, any well, other? That, yeah, Please. Just say, I mean, that makes perfect sense to me, too. But you have, there are one and two families in other one of the R districts, as well Correct. as the B districts. So this has to be taken beyond the R. One and R two. So you mean zero. four, three, four, five, six, seven? There, um, there could be one and two families sure. in, in all of those, and of course, what we're leaving out then is all the three families in the two, Correct. R twos, which we can't do because it's limited in the, mm -hmm. in in the, the way that one it's written to one and two. Right, and unfortunately, in the B districts, it does include three families. So, but, but, would we be able to separate that out? Well, we can't and, and, create any. Yep. Right. And, and one, one of the one of the reasons I left out everything above two families is because you were you were taking on something for um, open space for I think it was it was just the B districts, B districts, but you were also taking on the MT communities legislation. Correct. And so and so so it feels like whatever I do here is either going to be interfering or changed by what you're planning on doing in eight months. So I said, we'll, we'll leave it out for now. Whatever you, you'll figure something out later on for the other cases, and this will just take care of the minor residential ones. Right, so I think I completely hear what you're saying. So one of the questions that I think as a board we should discuss is, you know, I think this is a good idea. Do we think that we should fix a portion of it now, or if the article was originally proposed in such a way that constrains it beyond what we think needs to be done to rectify it across all of the different districts, um, if we should make that recommendation and push that to the fall. And again, you can you know, sure. continue forward if, if you would prefer, um, but I think that that's something that I'd, I'd love for us to, to discuss. Any other questions for for James or comments? James? I, I don't know what to do with this. I'm, I'm in favor of this article in general. And I like what you had to say about, you know, let's think about the one and twos that are in the other districts. I just don't know. And you're right. It doesn't have to be grass. It doesn't have to be bushes. It doesn't have to be trees. But... I'm guessing a lot of it is probably oh, yeah, grass, sure. bushes, and trees. And I'm just wondering, you know, what we're losing as a community by doing this. And I don't know the answer. I'm just wondering. It's a good question. Um, just to my two cents on that is that a 20 foot by 60 foot area is no less usable in my mind, it's that, you know, just throwing an arbitrary number out there, right. it has, right. you know, then a 25 by 25 foot. Well, the, the alternative is what's 25 by 25? 625. 620 is just to change it. So you have to have a 625 square In whatever foot. configuration in whatever it is. Configuration right. Give me a trapezoidal, it is. Little, and that's the and other thing, any, is they're any. all. Any. So that would yeah. be the alternative to what James is yep. suggesting. But at that point, that, inc that includes the little side strips that are the. Uh, regular setback open space yeah, and so at, that, at that point it's even more duplicative yeah we talked about it before yeah. mm -hmm. and you know we, we start saying okay you got a five Sorry. foot yeah. you got a five yeah, foot strip so going the whole hundred right. foot and then you turn the corner and now, <laughs> now you got a little things that looks well, like a golf saying, club you I'm know I'm not saying you should I'm just saying you know I, I got my, you. my fear is not there are a few homeowners and I feel for them who might not be able to put on a porch or an addition but what are we as a whole community losing in terms of green space and trees. Well, how many so of those come up in, on I, zoning? I don't know. I yeah, think that's the question is too, sorry, is 
are we losing anything if the rear side and front setbacks are still in place? And mm -hmm. I don't know that we are. And I think that's what James mm -hmm. has demonstrated right. through his examples is that yeah. we're not losing. There are so many other restrictions in place. Well, we're losing, if we're losing some open space in every one of his examples, in, in spite of the setbacks and mm -hmm. lot, minimum lot, yeah, if, if we're not losing any open space, he wouldn't need to do this. So we're losing some open space. Well, well, I, don't, I don't think that's true. We're losing the requirement to create more open space well, in some by, by adding to, by adding gross floor area to a home. Even yeah, if it's up, not out. Yes. Right. 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 Yeah. Anyhow. Sorry. May I tell you? Just one, <laughs> one thing that, um, just to note here is there's a lot of things in the zoning bylaw that make it hard to estimate actual build out. Um, and when you have things that rely on a calculus of an unknown future condition, um, and what I mean by that is right now, a calculate in order to estimate build out or in order to estimate, you know, what is the overall number of x uh, what's the overall number of open space that we have in the community we, we cannot calculate that because it's based on gfa it's a percentage that's based on gfa and we run into this situation in the business districts as well because we have a situation where your setback is your h divided by your whatever and then your l plus you know yep. and, and so when you're trying to understand or create projections for what the overall community is and or could be that would be an argument for, for simplifying it in a sense because this would sort of change it so that it's purely based on dimensional numerical requirements that are established based on the overall parcel size. Yeah, this is just the tip of the iceberg, as Ken said. <laughs> Any other questions or comments for James before I open it up? Just remember, we talked, remember we, we talked about this stuff for like uh, Sorry, Ken. Uh, weeks. Sorry, on this thing here, here. Uh, back back in the day. No, I'm glad you brought it back up. Yeah. Yep. And, As uh, Great. I have nothing more to say. Okay. Uh, this time I'll open it up for public comment. Anyone who wishes to um, to speak, please introduce yourself if you wouldn't mind by first, last name, and address, and you'll have up to three minutes. Should I sit here? I'm Susan Stamps, town meeting member, 39 Grafton Street, and a member of the tree committee. Um, we have a new environmental planner, David Morgan, who has a vision for the town um, as a place that will sustain not only its residents, not only its, its people of different um, social classes and income groups, but also the wildlife, the, the plants, the insects and all the pollinators and all the life that sustains us here in the community. And one of the things that he's been talking about publicly is the need to intentionally create green space and wildlife corridors. And um, it, it, I think I'm very impressed with James's work. Um, I think that um, I, I agree with Ken that uh, it, I think the town might be better served to do this kind of planning as a holistic plan and not piecemeal. Um, I don't know what the unintended effects would be of eliminating open space. If you've got places that do not have much in the way of setbacks, you are going to, if you also lose the green space, the open space requirement, you will lose overall open space. I don't pretend to be a zoning expert, so I barely understand it, but it seems to me that when you are in a dense community only to become way denser, the last thing we should be talking about without understanding, without having a whole, whole of town plan is removing open space. So those are my comments. Great, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else uh, wishing to make any comments? Please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, Chris Loretti, uh, 56 Adams Street. I oppose this article for several, re several reasons. First, it's that it's inconsistent with the master plan. Let's look at what the master plan says about residential districts. Standards that affect intensity of 
use, such as maximum flow rate or ratio, lot coverage maximum percent, setbacks, open space ratios, etc., cetera, um, seem reasonable and consistent with pre prevailing development patterns in the neighborhoods. So the master plan does not see any need to change this. What the proponent's doing is cherry picking particular parameters, in this case, the usable open space requirement to achieve a particular end. He talks about Medford, he talks about Lexington, but he doesn't tell you that a significant portion of Lexington has a larger lot size requirement for single family dwellings. Lexington limits the size of homes. Medford also limits how big an accessory structure like a garage can be in the backyard. Arlington doesn't do that. And what Medford also does is limits the amount of parking. They have a maximum parking amount. Arlington doesn't do that. If you approve this proposed change, as it is right now, anyone can put as much parking on their lot as they want. There's no limit on how, if you want to you know, completely pave over your backyard, because that's what the usable open space prevents. People seem really confused about what usable open space is and thinks you, you have to build a swimming pool or a tennis court or something like that or think you can't put native plantings and that's ridiculous. What usable open space does is limits what you can do with that space. It says you can't put a building there, you can't put a driveway there, and you can't put parking there. You remove this requirement, you can put any of those things there and that's not acceptable. Um, and so you know, you need to, I think you need to look at it in that perspective and you need to look at his figures again, proponent's figures, because the buildings and things he's showing are not to scale at all. They're very misleading. Um, I'm sympathetic to the issue of creating nonconformities, but the place that the bylaw should be changed, if that's a problem, is in the section of nonconformities. It shouldn't be throwing out completely the usable open space requirements. And it sounds like the ZBA in conjunction with the um, building inspector are going in that direction, but that's really where the change should be if indeed it is a problem. It shouldn't be just to get rid of the usable open space requirements in, you know, in um, as, as an isolated change. And as others have said, you, you need to consider these things in, its, in their totality. And that's why the master plan talks about this whole set of different requirements that affect the intensity uh, of development. So I hope you'll will not approve this as it is right now. Certainly there are more modern ways of looking at open space like permeable surfaces and impermeable surfaces and things like that that the town should consider. But simply you know, doing a wide scale um, removal of the current requirements is not appropriate at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Great. Uh, so at this point we will uh, move back to questions from the board or any further comments starting with Steve. Nothing further. Gene? Um, nothing further. And Ken? I'm good. Great. Actually, Do you have any I... questions for us? Yes, actually. Um, uh, Ken, you had asked a question about the number of cases this might apply in, right? Yes. Um, one thing that I had thought of after you mentioned that, so when, so we, we, we went through a similar process where we have that actually, that image in the thing is actually our house, where we are just over the limit so we are just a little bit non-conforming so we were allowed to drummer by right um what we learned in that process is that when because of this requirement you have to show up to the inspector's office with a permit so you find that after you go to them and you don't have your um your or sorry, not permit survey after you file with them after a month they tell you you need your survey then you have to get on the inspector the surveyor's schedule and then they have to do that and you have to wait for their results so that cost us about six months of delay in getting started so there there is like a, a cost to the the person who's on the on the receiving end of this and the other thing is if you are if the survey results come back and say you are conforming and you would become not conforming they tell you right then and there that you need a variance if you have if you're working with an architect they will tell you you're not going to get that variance because they know how variances work so i, th I think if if this were to happen, the ZBA would not have seen those cases because the person would not have been foolish enough to waste their time and come before them. That, I don't know if that made any sense. No, it does. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think one thing we might, the reason I don't have examples of this happening is because I think the way the system is set up may be so that you don't actually get those reported results. So just a thought. Great. Thank you. Nothing else for me. Fantastic. Um, like I said, I, I think 
Um, I'm definitely supportive. I would just like to see this. It's going to be a yeah. very so, long main motion. Right. So we can. Um, yep, I can work with know, that. I think look at how that might. Cool. Great. Right. Thank you. Any, nothing else? Any other questions, comments? Great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, all right. So at this time, we will close the um, public hearings for 2023 annual town spring annual town meeting. Um, and uh, again, to note that on uh, March 20th is when um, the redevelopment board will meet again to discuss um, the uh, articles that were presented. 27. Yeah. 27. 27. 27. Thank you very much for correcting me. I appreciate that. We're not meeting on the 27th. Thank you. Correct. The 27th um, to uh, to review, to discuss and vote on each one of the articles that was presented this evening and last Monday night. And uh, if you have any questions between now and then, please reach out to the board. Uh, so with that, we will um, close agenda item number one and move to agenda item number two, which is open forum. So anyone here with us this evening who'd like to speak, I'll ask you to raise your hand. Oh, please. And again, uh, first, last name and address for the record. <clears throat> Thank you, Susan Stamps, um, Grafton Street on the tree committee. Um, just to follow up on what I said before, um, our new environmental planner, David Morgan, said has said he's been around town talking to different groups and he's talked about um, how he wants to have an ecological infrastructure, he call, uh, ecological framework, he says, to our planning um, so that all the zoning decisions we make and any other park decisions, any other decisions we make regarding the natural environment and the built environment is all takes into consideration the ecology of the town and what kind of ecology we want in the town. So um, a town that's resilient, sustainable, healthy. Um, and so and I think it's a great approach. And that's what I was talking about before when I objected to just this piecemeal zoning. And I also wanted to add that we have a great planning department who are actual professionals who know how to put the pieces together and maybe make them all work, certainly better than I could. Um, and I would like to see us take advantage of their expertise in more of a whole of town approach to our zoning. That was all, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other uh, comments this evening? All right, with that, we will close open forum and uh, move to agenda item number three, which is new business. And I will ask Kelly if you have anything. Uh, just to note that on the 27th, um, uh, town council will be providing us either with a memo or he will be here to discuss the amendments, or sorry, to discuss the warrant articles regarding the transfer of ARB properties to the town. Um, so this is something that was placed on the warrant by the town manager. I don't have very much more information about it. That's why I've asked town council to either come before the board or to provide a memo um, because the board is being asked to weigh in on, not actually take a vote, but just to, um, it, it's a little unclear. <laughs> um, there's not going to be an actual vote. We don't have anything in a legal notice or anything like that regarding taking a vote on the warrant articles but i believe that they are looking for something from the arb regarding whether they are favorable or not on um, this motion that will go before the select board great thank you for the update Can I ask a question on that please uh this is just for the maintenance and care of it or the whole thing because it was i thought it was always and we always agreed that we were going to maintain control over who goes there and and whatever for the betterment of the town. And that was given to us as the responsibility of part of uh, planning all along. And I think that's just not right to be asked, not asked to just give it up. Uh, my understanding, 
my conversation, the last conversation I had with the town manager was exactly what you just identified, that it was um, moving the responsibility for maintenance and operations of these properties, but not for the review of leases, et cetera. Um, use. In the use, correct. Um, but that apparently is not what is in the proposal. So that's what we will have um, Doug Heim join us to discuss. All right. Because I'm going to object to that. Yeah, we'll, we'll have a discussion on the 27th, okay. but yes, that is okay. not reflective of the last conversation that was. Okay. So I just found out about this a couple of days ago when I looked at the warrant and was very surprised to see it there. And I mentioned it to Rachel just before this meeting began. So I would like it to be on the agenda so that we can take a vote. Um, we may not want to take a vote. But I don't think it would be nice to at least have it on the agenda so we can take a vote and request that there be either a written or an in-person presentation to us discussing and explaining. That's my thought about it. Great. I have one other new business, unless you want to say something about this one? Nope. So last week, I didn't participate in the discussion on the warrant article on doggy daycare that Kristen Anderson brought forward because I wasn't sure what the ethical problems were not were. And I spoke to the attorney of the day in the State Ethics Commission, and I will file form some number something with the town manager as the appointing person that basically says, Chris and I are on this group together, but I can still exercise my independent judgment. So I will do that so I can do that. And um, I'd like, unless people object, I'd like to talk to Kristen, Ms. Anderson, about the article, because I would have said a lot of things about the article last week. I have no objection to that, I think that, again, we have encouraged any applicant for any article to come to, in, to the board for discussion. And we have often um, identified an individual from the board to um, provide feedback between, um, mm -hmm. between okay. meetings. So I have no concern with um, you reaching out with additional feedback on behalf of yourself, not on behalf not of the board. Just myself. Um, I think that that is absolutely reasonable. Any objections? No. Or other thoughts? No, no objections. Great. Thank you for your following up on closing <laughs> that loop, Jean. I appreciate that. Um, Kelly, did you have any other new business? Um, just that we had our first, uh, the first visiting session for MBTA communities on Thursday of last week, and we had more than 130 people in the Zoom space, and we had 230 people registered. So, um, We'll be following up with all everyone who registered via town notice, um, a lot of other ways that we're reaching out to people. We're um, issuing a survey starting tomorrow. Um, and the survey is really just kind of a companion survey to everything that was discussed at this visioning session. So anyone who wasn't able att to attend can still submit their, um, their ideas and what they would like to see. Um, we're also going to be releasing a visioning kit um, where it's basically like a meeting in the box. So anybody who wants to hold a separate meeting that's kind of very similar to what we did, but in the comfort of their own home or with friends and neighbors, they can also do that that way. So, <coughs> but overall, we're really excited about the turnout and the attention that was paid to this um, and the number of people who took time out of their Thursday night to join a meeting. Thank so, you. Yeah. And then we have another meeting this Wednesday. Correct. Yes, yes. So on Wednesday of this week at seven o'clock in town hall is the, um, third public meeting regarding the Mass Ave and Appleton intersection. Um, <coughs> that is the intersection where Charlie Proctor, a bicyclist, was killed several years ago. The town had made temporary safety improvements and then at the same time started a process to create more permanent long-term improvements. Um, so we are up to um, the point where we're ready to go to 100% design, but we wanted to have this final meeting with the community because there are a few other options that we just want to hear from people about. So we're in 
parallel with this, we're doing outreach to all of the businesses <coughs> within that stretch, um, which I believe is within between Herbert and Quinn Road. Um, it's kind of a distance on either side of that massive Appleton intersection. So we're talking to all of those businesses. We've been d sending direct postcards to abutters um, and people within a proximity of that. But I just want to make sure that people are aware that this public meeting is happening. And after this, we're applying for MassWorks funding for construction. So that would be like an application for probably five to seven million dollars of funding. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any other new business, Steve? Well, I was going to say just as a follow up, um, as someone who's personally been left hooked in that intersection, I am really happy to see the um, you know the safety improvements moving forward. Great. Thank you. Uh, any other new business, Ken? No. Jean? Steve? Yep. All right. Uh, We'll close agenda item number three and see if there is a motion to adjourn. So motion. Second. We'll take a vote starting with Steve. Yes. Jean. Yes. Ken. Yes. And I'm yes as well. We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone.